also on a zine that I was doing for MoMA, for the show that I did there, this curated show. So I was really only writing for three months and maybe sort of drawing, I was drawing every morning flowers. I wasn't making any um, oil paintings. I didn't have a studio really to work in at that time. And then I changed in the summer and got, a, I rented a studio for the summer here and I worked really hard. But um, the book was a largely completed partly in the strange void we were in because of the pandemic. Um, I mean, I literally, that, that's what I had to do. Well, it's wonderful work and the essays are fantastic. And I guess my first question is a sort of general question is, what was it that got you started writing? Why did you feel the necessity to write? And as part of that, did you feel that what you were reading about art was unsatisfactory and and how so? Um, I didn't think it was unsatisfactory. I mean, I think there's a ton of um, of art writing that I love, you know, that ranges from you know people who are art historians to people who write about art as a secondary thing, um, or as you have said, alongside. You know, um, um, and I, I don't think it was uh, a process of dissatisfaction with what I had to read, but I think that it started with a dissatisfaction with the limitations of painting, it, only in the sense that they, for me, exclude a kind of precision linguistic kind of format you know, at their core. And so I, I think that I started writing kind of a long time ago. I didn't publish that much that often. Maybe I would publish like one thing once in a while when someone asked me. Mm -hmm. And then I started this zine in the year 2009. And that was when I really started publishing my own writing and, um, and writing kind of essay. I, I just invented a format for my own essays to exist in the presence of my paintings because I felt like I needed a sidekick or a translator or a kind of little training wheel. I think of it as like a third wheel. And, um, and, and then I really started to, um, to, to write more essays and I think people read them and invited me to write more things after that and the ball kind of got rolling. But I mean, I still don't do it very often. I mean, because it takes me so long to write and to edit. I'm a fanatic editor and polisher of, of, of words and I can't do it when I'm painting. So I really only um, can write when I set aside a couple of months to do a piece and I do not make art during that period. And so that's, that's why- it's, it's clear to me that you are, work very hard with words to get them to be precise. And one of the things that I really admire in these essays is that you're trying to talk about, in some sense, intangibles that uh, go into painting. Sometimes they're not intangible, like what goes, uh, what is needed to make colors. And you have a beautiful essay on going to um, God, now what's the name of the pearl paint, pearl paint in the, in the old days on Canal Street and testing or looking at different powders and ways you could combine and the engagement in it is also historical. You look to the past and where these colors were coming from and that is one of the most beautiful essays, I think. It's um, so the, the it's both tangible that you're choosing colors, but there's an intangibility to it and your language in finding ways to articulate uh, those spaces that are very hard, I think, for non artists to understand is truly phenomenal, I think. And I know you like poetry a, a lot and have read a lot of poetry. And I think that that comes through in your writing. Oh, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that the, I was thinking about what I was doing before we met today because I was thinking we were going to do this and what did I have to say? And I haven't talked about this book publicly yet at all. This is the first time we've, I've spoken to anyone about it. Um, and I do think what you're pointing to is the, um, is the source of the writing for me, which is that it exists in the middle, exactly in the middle, in this sort of dead zone between um, the practice of making visual form, especially the kind of action painting. I mean, I'm kind of an action painter, so I don't, I don't write while I, you know, do strokes. I mean, I was telling somebody this morning that it's like you can't do criticism while you're playing tennis. You just, that's impossible. So I feel like I think a lot about, I think I think in painting toward language and I think I think in language away from language and there's this sort of sense of a translation device and a middle man, some kind of, doesn't have to be a man, a, a middle figure um, where there's this. And so what I'm trying to always write about is something that isn't really very often written about, which is this sort of, um, this, this trying to find words to describe what it, what it feels like to make things while you're making them, which is inherently an anti-linguistic moment. At least it is for me. I think it's a lot about the, 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 the process of improvisation. And I've thought a lot about free jazz, free, um, you know, what's it called? Train of thought. I've thought a lot about, um, you know, free jazz or improvis improvised music. And I've thought a lot about psychoanalytic theory because it's like stream of consciousness, un, you know, unrehearsed. And I've thought a lot about what it means to just like right now I'm saying things, I have no idea what I'm gonna say next. I mean, we didn't rehearse this. Mm -hmm. And I've thought a lot about this weird space that's kind of, um, also I've thought a lot about improv comedy, which is definitely not the same as stand up and jokes, but it's akin, but none of those things are necessarily what I'm doing, but they're all, they're all part of, um, they're all under the, general um, umbrella of things that you do where you don't rehearse or you don't know what the literal next second's gonna be. Um, you, maybe it's what meditators get into, I don't know. Do you feel in working with words that it's more exposing than when you're painting? Oh, absolutely. It's, you have to, because there's an agreed upon uh, structure or, or set of coordinates, you know, a, a grammar, a rhetoric, some meanings um, that they're not necessarily agreed upon, but they're, we go along with them enough, regularly enough that, you know, you have to kind of, there's a, I think I also have a Midwesterner kind of position you know, kind of by nature, I grew up in the Midwest and I think there's a kind of mean what you say, say what you mean ethos to people who grew up in the Midwest that's kind of inherently different that I feel than a, a coast person. Um, that's an whole nother conversation, but I grew up by Lake Michigan where you mean what you say and you say what you mean and you spend a lot of time trying to figure out what that might be. And um, it's not ironic uh, what I write and how I write um, although I think I have a good sense of humor, yeah, it's a different, but it's trying to, yeah, what were you going to say? I was just saying it's, you're not an, I, I don't see irony in your work, but you do have a very good sense of humor. And I think it comes from the way in which you combine uh, the, the problem of not being able to exactly define what you're saying. So you come up with kind of, uh, words that kind of curdle together in an unusual way. I wanted to point to the beginning of your essay on ABEX, uh, In Defense of Abstract Expressionism, this, your second one, and just the first sentence, which just knocks me out. 
I kind of feel bad for Abex. <laughs> now, I don't know anyone who, maybe this is that Midwestern thing you're talking about. I don't know. But the way in which you start that essay and the, the trajectory is very interesting because you talk about what many people have said about Abex, but you say about one critic in particular that he doesn't get that it's gendered and uh, that abstract expressionism has been gendered and that the women have been put aside. And I thought I, thought I wanted to bring that into the conversation about the place of women in abstract expressionism. Well, you know, the whole Abex article started as an exact thing of what we were talking about, where it's a kind of translation device in between two things, because I actually wrote that essay because I had heard through the grapevine that a person that I knew had gone to the Abstract Expressionist show at MoMA and said, it's all about dead white men, straight men. And I was like, honestly, I, you know, I don't even know, like, I, can I say something? Am I allowed to say vulgarity here? I mean, I was like, who do you have to fuck around here to, <laughs> no, to have, to get noticed as a female um, who was doing that work? In other words, it's so, it wasn't an all male practice. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I mean, also its roots were in, in part in, uh, in response to, to black music, you know, and so it had other people in it in one way or another historically or as practitioners in ways that were not being covered by this person's dismissal. And so I always have loved and really cared about that part of art history and I've looked at it really carefully and I know that it contains to say like this is a zone of just that is to conflate what happened to those um, gestural or action painters in, in e both in history and also in kind of capitalism uh, and to mix those things up with who was actually doing them and what their sources were, you know? So I was angry that this critical theory kind of person, this artist that I knew, sort of slagged off the whole movement as being indistinguishable from these dead white males, straight males. And I was like, no, let's talk about how ways in which this weird limitation, first of all, that it isn't true. And second of all, that, it, that um, if anything, identity politics of the 90s had rein, reinvigorated, you know, a, an understanding of what a gesture from the body could even mean. And yeah. so I wanted to push the whole conversation to something that at least acknowledged contexts and, and histories that had been, that seemed to easily be left out. I mean, if he had just said to me, if the guy had just said to me, um, I hate this kind of work because it's so much about money and, and trophyism. I would have said, oh, okay. And I wouldn't have written the issue. I wouldn't have written the article, but I felt compelled to write the article because I was in an argument and I felt like I had to present a third, a different position and, uh, or just another position. So, I mean, I, I think sometimes all these, all of these things got going as a, um, as a, to, to address productive misunderstandings and, and weird mistakes and to try to illuminate something that wasn't, I was so frustrated that it wasn't being said. I think that's often the source of why you write, why one says, I have to do this because I haven't seen this said yet. Um, I don't know that if that's similar, but I would imagine that's sometimes the source of painting as well, too, because we're all living in, um, uh, we do things in reaction to, not necessarily as an impulse or just as an anger, but we come into a situation, you come into a, a field and there's certain work being done and you see, but ah, this isn't being done. I'm, I'm thinking like this and I need to write this or I need to, to do that. I just wanted to get to, you mentioned 
you know, the action, you as an action painter. And in that sense, when you're painting, you're using your body, which is what you're not doing essentially when you're writing. And I just wondered how that difference affected you. I, I guess, you know, it's a, that's the personal part of this thing that I'm saying about a kind of struggle at the core of some kind of creative activity where you're trying to see something that you don't see or say something you haven't heard or respond to something you think is wrong. It's a kind of, it's a struggle. It's a, it's a wrestling match. It's something that you're trying to bring out that is suppressed or avoided or ignored or overlooked. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, that uh, I just, I think I literally knew about poetry and writing from my mom, literally. She was probably the earliest person that was a passionate reader. And I, and I know that my dad actually showed me how to paint on an easel. My parents were divorced and I was never with them at the same time ever because they split up early when I was a baby. So there's already a structure there of like trying to figure out how to get from like dad who showed, he wasn't an artist at all, but he tried to show me how you would you put, make a picture on an easel. And my mom would like extol literature and poetry and, and words. And so it's already like, there's this blank terrain that I have to fill in. I mean, that's probably too personal to say on a no, I live think that, stream. That, no, I don't think that, I think that's very interesting. And it leads into your essay uh, on awkwardness. But maybe, yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, I feel like the, I guess, I guess what I think is that like, I'm interested in, in um, having not just a grudge match or a fight, but like trying to work something out. And I, I don't really know how to do that, you know, um, in painting exactly without resorting to the world of um, history, theory, poetics, you know, the availability of this kind of mesh of language that helps you push the thing toward and, you know, push it around. But I'm not a conceptual artist in that the work is rooted in a linguistic matrix, I guess, is the word. Mm -hmm. um, it's rooted in, in uh, a form of, an old form that I very much admire and love, which I don't really know, it's not necessarily just based in action painting, American post-war painting, but I think that's just like a good name for it. I don't call myself an expressionist, but I do call myself kind of a weird, maybe it's with quotes around it, but action painter sounds good um, to me. And I feel what? like it, it's, about it's about improv. It's literally about this, this, the work of improvisation, exactly in the same way like that we know jazz musicians who, have PhDs and can write about um, improvisation as a philosophical position or as an endeavor. Um, but we also know jazz musicians, you and I both know them, who are not intellectually organized around, you know, a defense of their work or an explanation, but their work is done in the ephemera, in the moment, as a response, you know, in this kind of incredible tennis match or wrestling match or whatever you want to say that's about it's or it's like dance you know it has to be done in the moment it it can't be done in like reverse and forward it has to be done in that second of the breath of the moment and so that um i don't think that's how language works because it it's how we're i'm speaking right now but if i need to edit it's going to be written down and we're going to go back and forth and we're going to go command c command v command X, um, I do, and that I do just think that, is, that, sorry, I do think that jazz was the first postmodernist move. And I do think that, you know, everybody's talking about listening now, but if you watch a band, a jazz band in particular, not all, they are listening to each other because it's yeah. a dialogue and they want to respond to what the other is doing. So you know, what's happening in hip hop and other forms of contemporary movement has a lot to do 
with the way in which jazz set up this notion of borrowing, repeating, you know, communicating. Uh, responding. Between, yes, responding. And I think that, I think that, I think my interest in abstract expressionism is very much about borrowing, repeating, responding, and then, and then undoing and, mm -hmm. and erasing and getting rid of and then re trying to rebuild. It's a dialectic. I think about you and also Ad Reinhardt, not that your paintings are similar, but Ad Reinhardt made a division between his painting and his cartoons, his political writing, let's say, as cartoon. And, not, and your writing, your essays, of course, have, have their own politics. Uh, I, I mean, in the broadest sense of, you know, what it means to live in the city, a city, the polis. And one of the things I found in your looking back in history, at, at art and art history and theory, is that the way in which you took on John Chamberlain. And I wondered, uh, because you dealt with him differently from any other writer I know, and I'm not an expert in Chamberlain, but I had never read as uh, thorough a re, a re seeing of Chamberlain's as your essay. And I, I wondered if you, would you want to read something from that or? Sure, I can. I would Although I want to just, I want to just say one thing. I want to shout out to Klaus Curtis and um, a number of other writers that when I was preparing the John Chamberlain essay, it was for to do a lecture at DIA where uh, Lynn Cook asked me if I would pick a person in the DIA collection and write about them. And in a similar way that I wrote um, about ABEX in a kind of, no, you've got it wrong. I, I chose the exact person that I thought they had I, I was actually confused about why he was even in the Dia collection, which I kind of thought was all like minimalist and post-minimalist clean stuff. And here was this crazy mess, gaudy, vulgar, in, in questionable taste, you know, where everything else at Dia is in perfect taste. And I, I said, okay, I want to write about him. But it, was, it started with this sense of like, what the hell is he doing there? Mm -hmm. And um, actually, um, in doing that, I read pretty much everything that was ever written. I mean, I read everything that I could find in the DIA library, which is, I think, everything. And there was great writing on him. And a lot of it was about, it wasn't exactly how I was putting it, but it was definitely, I just want to say, there is great Chamberlain writing out there, but not a lot of people understand Chamberlain. So that's why there's not great. There's not a lot. I mean, it's not floating around. You have to look. But I can read some Chamberlain. I, I, um, I'll read a little bit of the thoughts on James, John Chamberlain. Um, it just starts by saying, I didn't think too much about John Chamberlain's work until a visit to Chinati in 2002 when I saw one of his couches. I actually wasn't sure what this huge foam thing was, but you could climb on top of it. And it was flanked by two video monitors playing a Jack Smith-esque hippie sex movie, which turned out to be Chamberlain's own 1968 film, The Secret Life of Hernando Cortez. On a little shelf nearby, there was a printed statement by Chamberlain, partly about laziness. Quote, in what I do, constant hard work is not necessary. My drive is based on laziness. I don't mind admitting that I'm lazy because laziness is for me an attribute. And so then I'm just gonna go on and I'm moving to this other part. I sort of describe in between how he got both praise and attack from both left wing and right wing sides. Um, and it says, apparently whether from the right or the left, Chamberlain was just too ghostly celebratory of the capitalized gesture of intuition. From either side, gesture itself was now at least suspicious, if not completely bankrupt. But what uh, I talked about how he got a bad review from Hilton Kramer. But what this bad review points its finger at are the very characteristics that we might find great about Chamberlain's work now, his works identifying a specific bad taste. One of his work's formal functions is precisely its superficiality, literally how things appear, 
are formed by their surfaces, deal with surface. With a historical turn of the screw, this quality is somehow redeemed in a post-Warhol time when surface itself is of supreme importance and when surface itself self-critically reveals what is suppressed by what lays on top. By fully deploying tactility in all of its expressionistic vulgarity, Chamberlain literally provokes the issue of taste, the limits of taste, the dictates of taste, his delivery system of surfaces and facades, all done up in a fleshly, audacious array of color, are all part of what I love about this work now. His work may be a commodity, but it is a meeting of flesh and commodity. And then it kind of goes on. I think it's just so terrific. For one thing, I know that you question, well, and I do too, the, the how taste comes into viewing art and how troubling it is and how many people don't think that, that taste is guiding their choices uh, and when in fact I don't know how you get around it. I just wondered if you'd talk a little bit more about taste and vulgarity. I mean I really I, I really um wrote about, I really had never thought about that question so much, probably not as much as you have, but that's like what I said about how I knew that there was this one guy that stood out in Dia as not being in good taste. And then when I read an amazing essay by TJ Clark called In Defense of Abstract Expressionism, which I read not for the Chamberlain, but I read like all time great quote, where he was writing about Hans Hoffmann, and he said, the painting above the couch, the, the painting above the couch betrays the secret, blurts out the secret that the owner of the painting wishes to keep, or something like that. It was this amazing description of like a, a, like a, a painting as like a, a gross, un, uncomfortable admission of like your desire or your physicality or your, you know, expressionism, you know, in this horrible way. And all of that, you know, was written, you know, in, in, in that essay, it was like all under the terms of this, um, this terrible mistake that you shouldn't really make in these, in these times, like we shouldn't be doing that anymore. And, and, in, and, in, and it was true, like, I grew, went to art school in the 70s when you weren't supposed to be doing that anymore. There was a reason for it. But I think partly it was about how ex action, let's call it action painting, you know, it got uh, affected to money and, you know, value. And um, it, it started to s seem like, you know, part of bad taste was doing anything that had ever been um, said to be good by horrible, gross, people who are, you know, whether they're gross and horrible because they run museums or they buy art or they run capitalism or they work at banks, you know, like I knew from the get go from art school in the 70s that like the, a lot of the work that I love was in bad taste. I always say I have horrible taste, you know, that I just don't have good taste. And like, I, I, I don't really even know what it is. And it's been a great, it's get, been, it's been really helpful to have bad taste because then I don't have to go by that. Um, I'm not sure how you mean it. I mean, I'm interested in what you think about it, but I like it when things are wrong. I like it when things are embarrassing. I think it's really important. And I think you, when you're an artist, especially if you're a painter, you're on to something you have to pay attention to when stuff, it, it, A, goes horribly awry and B, uh, the fact that it looks like a dead zone to begin with you know, like an off limits kind of place. I mean, all of these mistakes and no goes and accidents, these are interesting places to explore. Yes, and you know, I love that essay by uh, Gertrude Stein, Composition as Explanation. And one of the things that she does, I think it's one of the most brilliant uh, art criticism pieces ever. But what she does is she explains why at one time something will seem ugly and that at another time it becomes a classic. And yeah. she says for people who are interested in art or writing, 
those things are important. They're looking at this, but not everybody is interested in inventions in art or it's just not important to them. It doesn't mean that they are stupid or don't have, they're just not interested. But then the problem with any piece of art, so let's say it's ugly in the beginning to in terms of what the mainstream thinks, but then in time it might become beautiful. And then she said the problem is it becomes a classic. And then the cycle begins all over again. And I think that yeah. that, you know, sensibilities change. And part of why they change is because of what writers and artists do. So for instance, if you think about Sylvia Plath, when she wrote her poem in the early, when it was published in the early 60s, I think it was published after she died, uh, in which she referred to her father in relationship to the Holocaust. Well, if you re read re writing at that period, cr critics, they were horrified that she would make that connection. Now it wouldn't be the case because she has in some ways changed the limits of language and how it can be used. You might still think it's bad taste, but the way in which she used it in that poem had a kind of resonance, particularly for women who were dealing with patriarchy in a certain way, but not only, not only, but also. Yeah, well, I mean, because I think that rules and limits and no go those are not just about, you know, fashion and what is done and what is not done by cultured people and whatever smart people, but it's also about um, limits, regulations, policing, self-policing, you know, this kind of um, uh, wish, you know, it, it, you know, things that you won't dare do because you're told not to or you're never even told it's a possibility or 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 you do do it and you're punished for it you know i mean the the these things bleed from the social space to the personal space you know absolutely immediately right and so like you know if you um you know it's not just like about you know achieving success or you know getting to where you know you you feel like you can express yourself or something it's about really seeing how people are kept in line and and legislated and policed um in terms of the way that they speak and and act and work and do things and you know keeping people out of the art world i mean this is something that we've been talking about and thinking about a lot you know for decades you know and now it's a very big subject and you know in the cultural spheres like to enable uh different kinds of uh rules and and um how do you not different kind of rules to like really question all the kind of boundaries that are um that are enacted and i feel like there's a possible that's why there could be radicalism in form mm -hmm. you know in i i i think that like some conversations about form are always really important if they're not just about what we would call formalism you know like more rules about you know what to leave out and how to do something um but if we really understand form and content and if we also really understand the relation the fluidness between individual behavior and like social construct we we have to you know it then we will look at all the ways that you may hate yourself as much as you may hate your opponents. This yes. internalized kind of um, regulation, self-policing is part of what you have to deal with as an artist every day, because you're kind of alone in your room in a way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you still have to like try to figure out what you will allow yourself to do. This is something you learn a lot when you teach, you know, because you deal with, you know, young people who are sort of, are trying to unlearn terrible things they've learned that have held them back. Yes, yes. I mean, I studied English literature and um, American history, but the English literature stuff, I, I, I felt I had to get rid of a lot of the things that had been put in my, in my, in my mind. 
I wanted to get to another of your essays, the one on Maria Lasnig. And uh, I didn't know about her work until, I don't know, in the last five years or something. And that's always interesting and disturbing. And this is true in literature too. There's so much that I don't know that's around and uh, suddenly you're reading someone. For me, that's Natalia Ginsburg. I should have been reading her, I feel, you know, a long time ago. And now I've just buzzed through about five of her books. And it's, your essay on Lasnik is, is wonderful. And it's about that you were in town, in the city, the same time she was, but you never met. And that was sad for you. And so it's yet a different essay. Your essays have all these different flavors, if I can call it that. I wondered if you talk about what it means, whom you meet uh, uh, to an artist and to a writer, H how you come <laughs> upon people and um, how that's important, those meetings. I mean, you do, I mean, you might not meet them. You might not meet anyone. Like that's something we, we talked about this before, like, because we've talked about this, you, I know you like this essay and I think you partly like it because you've written so much about characters and personas and uh, life in general in the East Village specifically, mm -hmm. you know, some of your uh, books take place in apartments, you know, with people who, barely leave their apartment and go out to no take lease the garbage, on life. Yes. You know? no, no lease on life. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, I feel like, first of all, we've talked about this. I love that you like this essay because it's all about like this thing that seems so Lynn Tillman to me, which is that <laughs> like, I'm saying in the essay, I live on Avenue A, you live on <laughs> Avenue B. I, you live there for a decade. I never meet you. We, d we went to the same places. I just didn't run into you. Therefore, whatever would happened, you, didn't happen. Would you read a little bit from it? Yeah. <laughs> it's like my, it's almost like my re Madam Realism for Lynn Tillman about real people that you read about. I'm going to read the first two pages because I think it, it illustrates what you're talking about. Um, I wrote it because they asked me she died and they, and some, um, uh, and it, Hans Ulrich Obrist and Peter Pakesh um, who have to do with her estate asked me to write something for a catalog of a show in a posthumous show in Greece. Um, so I just wrote it. I wrote it on um, Valentine's Day 2017. Dear Maria Lasnig, I can't believe I didn't. Oh, by the way, can I just say this isn't like any of the other essays. This is like a straight up letter to a person. It's not, it's written epistolary form. Dear Maria Lasnig, Lasnig, I can't believe I didn't get to hang out with you when you lived in New York City. I was shocked when I found out you lived here for 12 years. 12 years? If we passed on the street, I didn't know it. But for six of your 12 years here, I lived around the corner from you. And I went to the same school, SVA. And I wore the same outfit I've seen you wear in pictures, <laughs> a sweatshirt and sneakers. And like you, I smoked cigarettes while painting. I even know people who live in your old studio building on Avenue B and went to some crazy parties there after you'd left. Like you in the 70s, I hung out with a lot of women and experimental filmmakers. I'm sorry to say that in the 70s, I didn't even know your work, though we were in so many of the same rooms and streets. What boggles my mind is that this is even possible. You lived and worked around the corner from me, and I assume that means you also ate soup at, Od at Odessa walked by the dog park in Tompkins Square Park and saw that old Russian guy with the giant newspaper hat who lived in a doorway on 7th Street. <laughs> you must have done all that because we all did. Did you have lovers or drink at that old wooden bar on the corner of 7th and B? Though I recognize your style in pictures, I don't recognize you. Would I have even had the nerve to talk to you if I'd met you or to invite myself to your studio? I doubt it. I would have been intimidated. New Yorkers can be sh surprisingly shy. And though you are often smiling in photos, you look a little forbidding with your thin mouth and your rimmed glasses. Once, much later in Vienna, at a fancy dinner to celebrate a Cy Twombly show, I sat on a couch with you. You were very old, and I knew exactly who you were, but I did not say hello. I just stared at your gigantic white sneakers, which 
which looked exactly like the clumpish forms in your paintings. You were on one side of the couch and Franz Vest was on the other. I was on a seesaw of artistic greatness balanced between you two. I was such an idiot not to address you, but you both looked pretty creaky and each of you had canes and a helper. Right after that, you both died, and I was so frustrated that I had failed to blurt out with stupid eagerness how much I love your work and how it sustains me. But you were absorbed in your own stuff that night, and I knew better than to bother a lady genius with giant white sneakers. So I said nothing when I could have said, hey, you lived around the corner from me in New York City for six years. How the hell did we not meet? So that's how it starts. I, ju I just love that essay for so many reasons. I know we're going to go into chats. I mean, oh, we got to go to, we got to go to, yeah, it's time. It's 346. Okay. But I just wanted to say one thing about that. These days it's so different because of MFAs and internet and stuff. And you can meet in a way people that you didn't feel you could even approach <laughs> before. So, but you don't like what I really love about art or writing or life in the city or the world is that a lot of times it just doesn't work out and you don't meet the right person and the person lives there or you don't make those connections because you don't treat the world like a country club or you decided to do something that brought you somewhere else and then you missed that connection or it didn't work out for one reason or another or something bad happened there was a pandemic and something closed and or whatever you know and and it doesn't mean that you don't make your work, but there's, but we're gonna all have to refigure all of this out now because all of those systems are under, under change, under conditions of change, many for good reason, because sometimes it was a country club. And I'm interested in outsiders always because it shows that the system doesn't work. And I'm convinced that the system doesn't work and it isn't a meritocracy. And I'm looking for, what sustains people who are, 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 are not, you know, it doesn't, the thing is a failure. That's a good place to go into a Q&A. <laughs> well, now we take yeah. questions. Yeah. Lynn, do you want to take over? Yes, but I just somehow lost it. Hold on. Uh, going to the Q&A, we've got one from Claudia Riga. Riga, do you want to? Um, ask that live. Should I write, should I read it? Yeah. Um, it says, do you think the work, the work on the book influenced the work you then did for the show at Gladstone? Maybe it condensed your thoughts. Um, I would just say no. Uh, um, it didn't, it didn't affect, did the work on the book? No. It, it's totally two streams of work for me. Um, I, I work, you know, I worked on the show for a year. I was working on the show before the pandemic and it was postponed for six or for a number of months. So I had already done that and I'd been writing for 10 years on and off. Um, and they, they kind of don't come together very often. And one of the things that I treasure about Benjamin and Antonia and and Francois and 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 um, Charlotte is after eight books is that they thought of having a book where I had drawings together with writing, and that was I had not conceived of that and was incredibly grateful and thrilled when that was proposed. I think the thing I'm the most proud of is that I drew the drawings from my own book. I mean, it just thrills me that I was able to illustrate and write a book. Um, but, you know, honestly, it just had nothing to do with the painting. I mean, it's just a different realm of endeavor. The, the drawings are great, by the way. We didn't get into any discussion about those. What's the next yeah. question? We should share some of your drawings uh, as part of the book. I can, I can actually put here, I'm going to share screen for one second. Um, I was just going to, how do I do this? Can you see the yeah. thing? I was just going to, I drew these pictures of people working that were in the book. Um, and I also, this is actually a part, this one is a drawing of, of Chinese 
workers um, making iPhones, which was mentioned in the essay on color. It was about, you know, um, how it was actually in a section where I talked about how color is this kind of emancipatory free thing, freeing thing on, on the one hand, and on the other hand, color is responsible for some of the most repressive and horrible regimes and systems, uh, you know, like mining and, you know, uh, you know, you know, Nazis and, you know, slave traders. And then I, I mentioned uh, a section about like, what about your iPhone with its millions of colors, which is made by these people who are working in hideous, unbearable conditions. But I was just going to try to show you the picture of it's really way back there. There's Maria Lasnig. And um, so in s part of my pandemic was spent um, drawing pictures. Uh, literally, I didn't have a studio and I didn't have a, a printer. I still don't have a printer. I don't have anything out here with me. So I would draw stuff from photos and I would literally cut it out, take pictures on my phone, drop them into uh, iPhoto. And then like I drew the shadow in iPhoto. I mean, this was just total handmade bedroom productions. I think that you can sort of see that's older, but um, I anyway, a lot of the, I, I love the way you've worked the shadow behind Lasnig. It, well, has, has it, has, it, has, it, has, it has a lot of resonance in terms of uh, the, the meaning in your uh, essay also. Well, I'm gonna stop sharing, thanks. But you know, like, so the Lasnig was like adjusted in Photoshop. Um, and that was how I did it. I would take pictures that I drew with pen and ink on my kitchen table and then literally try to not take them at night so there wouldn't be like the shadow of the light bulb hanging down over them. And then I would drop them into Photoshop and clean them up and change them and draw the shadows in and send them to Benjamin, who would then send them to Marco, who was the designer. Um, and so it was like a whole... Um, it really was like bedroom, I don't know how to say it. This book was made for a really long time. And I would actually like to just say one other thing. Part of what makes this book great is not what I did. Part of it is that you wrote a beautiful foreword, which I thank you for so much, Lynn. Oh. And the other part of this book is that it's lushly annotated with footnotes that, that were written, I think, um, well, I don't know who exactly was responsible for who. So I don't want to say names if it wasn't correct, but the people at After Eight Books made these extensive and amazing footnotes about every single thing that seemed to need some kind of explication. And it's a beautiful part of the book that is entirely not by me, it's by them. And they all deserve total credit for these, like when I talk about Avenue B and Millennium Film Archive and you know Jack Smith and you know the Dia and Projective Verse and Charles Olson and uh, trans people and you know you know making abstract expressionist paintings and who, whatever and whomever I wrote about they did so much um, extensive footnoting that was really important to me and I'm so grateful it makes the book amazing. We'll answer the two other questions. by Haniko Zara. Is there a perfect audience for your paintings and is it different from the audience for your writings? Um, God, I don't even know how to answer. I think the, it's the same audience in the sense that attentive people are the audience. I mean, I think my, my work is somewhat intimate um, I, I, I really rub the words together like frottage, you know, for months <laughs> until a new one is produced, which is kind of an intimate thing to do with words and kind of perverted. And I edit my paintings for months, sometimes years, until like a kind of a result or a resolution springs forth. And then I try to make it look like the painting was done in a minute. Um, so I think that the perfect audience is someone who's patient and into intimacy and obs observing delicately uh, at a granular level how something is made. Um, I, think, I think the perfect audience for me is a formal person, a person who's very interested in form and how form is created. Um, 
And that, I think that's the answer. And the last question, why was now the perfect time to publish your writing by Ali Hochstorfer? Oh, Hi, Ali. Um, why was now, I don't know. Um, that's a question for after eight books. I didn't, like I said, this was for me like a gift. You know, they, they proposed it and we worked on it for a really long time. So the now was idea. actually a really, because huh? everyone's at home reading. It's a perfect time for your book. Well, it's a perfect time to publish a book. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's better time for a book than it is for a painting show in the sense that a great number of people cannot uh, get to the painting show. That's right, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing, you know, the main thing, you know, we could go on for another hour. I know we're not going to, but the main thing about what is the difference in, in what is the receiver of a reader of a book versus a beholder of a painting? Um, which is partly what I try to write about, which is the difference between how that feels and how perception feels and how making feels while you're perceiving simultaneity. And I mean, the you know, a book is a thing that has no, original in a way or I don't know what you would say Lynn I mean maybe your manuscripts are the original the type notes the like the the notebooks and the and the drafts and all the crossed out things that you use to write in the margins I don't know if you think of those as the original but this is not um, a handmade thing right. it's a machine made thing and my paintings are literally like each one no machine can make them because nobody knows the rules because there are no rules and I mostly just erase them and build them up again. So there are these time capsules all pressed into each other, but paintings are by their nature, uh, you know, individual units that have no siblings in a sense. <laughs> I mean, they're, each one is kind of different from the other where, I mean, like, mass produced things, they have a whole different vibe. I, I guess it's like, remember, you know how David Grubbs, you know, wrote a book called something like, um, what's it called? It's, I went to a talk about it. It's called something like, you know, Recordings Ruin Music. I, please forgive me to whomever is listening to this and don't, I don't know, I don't remember the title, but I mean, you know, there's this way in which a live thing is different from a, production, a thing made at a factory. And, um, you know, Lynn, I, I mean, you, you have feelings about that. I'm sure you wrote about the factory and, and Andy, Andy Warhol. Well, when I saw um, at, uh, I forget which gallery, it'll come to me, uh, Bernadette Corporation had made one, co one copy of a book that they written. There it was in a vitrine. And I thought that may be the only, <laughs> original, I mean, apart from going back early, early, early uh, in the history of bookmaking, that there was, you know, one of a kind, but you're right, it's a mass media, you know, and uh, I don't think of, I don't think of my uh, archive, archive as originals in that way. It's, it, I, I don't, but I am always astonished that artists can give away or sell a work that they don't have a copy of. <laughs> that's, that's amazing to me. Yeah, well, that's why, I mean, I started making zines to begin with because they were a dollar, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I could give, I could make, I could make the, I have the exact same level of love and care and hate and grudge and wrestling. I have the exact same amount of struggle and process in writing as in painting, but I can give somebody my writing for, for free or, or I can produce a zine and charge a dollar or nothing, they can steal it. Um, you know, and that was really important to me that I could embed a gift into a painting show. Um, that's a whole different conversation about circulation. Yes, yeah. How are we doing, Chian? Good. Um... Now we're out of time, but I do want to acknowledge that in the question uh, section, there's acknowledgments of the book and this talk. 
and appreciations. So I just want to acknowledge that. Okay, so that concludes our book launch discussion and celebration of the newly published Amy Silman Faux Pas, Selected Writings and Drawings. Thank you, Amy and Lynn, for your time. And thank you all for coming and being here with us. Um, to order signed copies of the book, please visit artbook.com or our Instagram page for more information. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chian. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Thank, you. thank you After Eight Publishing. Thank you, Amoma PS1 Bookstore. Thank you, DAP. Thank you, Barbara Gladstone Gallery. Go visit the show at Gladstone Gallery if you yes. can. If you're yes. in New York. It's a wonderful Bye. Thank you. Bye, Amy. Bye, everybody. Bye.